Well, it certainly is a pleasure to be home, to be here, to be preaching. And I would like to say, Pastor, you've always felt like family to me. And so uh, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, it's going to be hard for me not to be a little emotional. Uh, I'll just let you know tonight uh, because, you know, this place does mean a whole lot to me. And uh, I was not going to try to cry a bunch tonight. I'm going to try not to, but it's hard because I'm living the dream. This is what I wanted to do. Um, God gave me a calling at 14 years old, and uh, we moved here, and, uh, you know, Kentucky born, Kentucky bred, but I didn't want to come to Maryland initially, you know, didn't know what Old Bay and crabs were, you know what I mean, that's weird to me, fried chicken and horses, that's what I know, and, uh, but we come here, and, but we made family, and I've always told Dad that the thing I appreciate about my father is that he's always allowed good people in my life. And as I look out, and I mean this, and that's where if I could encourage those that are here to make relationships with those people in your church that are older than you. And uh, I always say when I went to college, it was kind of hard for me to make friends with my own age. I know that sounds funny, but I was always used to hanging out with older men and uh, older folks. I was. In fact, it's funny that uh, that, uh, I do have a girlfriend now. So... uh, (laughs) But uh, just thought I'd just throw that out there. Uh, by the way, uh, but it's funny when we first met, uh, we were there and we were talking, and there I was talking. I was at a wedding and we were talking with some of the family there, and her and her friend were there, and they said they were just listening, just watching me. And of course, I, I was talking then. You probably wouldn't believe that, but I was just talking on and on, and I was just telling a bunch of stories. And, and one of her friends said, "Are you 24 or are you 60?" They're like, "You know more about your 24 years than I do the past four years of Bible college." And I told him, I said, well, I grew up around older men my whole life, and so you had to have a story. If you didn't have a story, you weren't a part of the conversation. You had to have something going on. Make it up, but have a story, you know? And uh, so, uh, so I, that, that was always my, my tale to take. But I, just, I look back on all the years, and I just think back of wonderful people. And I think about the people that are sitting on the platform. And I think of my brother-in-law. We've been able to be very close. And, of course, brother-in-law Miss Amy, they're, they're family to us. And I can say that about many folks to you, then being able to work for my dad is, is, is it's just a dream. And uh, I want to say to you as Frederick Baptist Church, thank you for the opportunity and investing in me, not just as a staff member, but as a young man who's grown up in this ministry. I don't take it for granted. I don't take it for granted. It's not something that I wear on my sleeve. I don't, I don't ever uh, think anything of, of myself and what I'm doing because it's like dad was saying this morning, I didn't get here by myself. I'm just like, a, like, like Dr. Hamill said, I'm like a turtle on a fence post. Uh, he didn't get there by himself. And uh, that's me. And so I want to say thank you for that opportunity. And look forward to preaching tonight. Now, Dad always said as a young preacher to be a blessing when you get up to preach. And he said always be a blessing as a young preacher. So I'm going to be done in about five minutes. So hopefully that will be a blessing. <laughs> Actually, I, I, it's funny, Dr. Westmore, when he was here, he said that, that, that as a preacher, he said you get one minute for every year of your life, which means I get 24 and Dad gets 50. So I just <laughs> thought I'd throw that out there. I kind of like to help him remind him of those things every now and again. He can still whoop me, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I'd like for you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. want to be a blessing. I, I mean that. I want to be a blessing and an encouragement tonight. Something that the Lord laid on my heart. Through uh, reading his scripture, and the song's going to go with that today. Hopefully it'll be a truth that will apply to our lives, and uh, something that will be an encouragement. But the title of my message tonight is, It's Amazing What Praising Can Do. Amen. It's Amazing What Praising Can Do. We're going to read in Acts chapter 16, a very familiar story to us. We're going to read kind of through some of the verses. Acts 16, we're going to begin in verse number 16. And the scripture says, in Acts 16, 16, it says, And it came to pass... As we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us. This is Paul and uh, Barnabas talking here. A spirit of, of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers. Now, I'd like to stop here and just point this out. You know, verse 19, this is not having to do with the message, but I just feel this is just good preaching for a second. The world, the world will use you for, uh, for what they can get from you as long as they can get it from you. But when they're done, they're done. 
The world only cares what it can gain and not what it can give. The world only gives to what it thinks it can get back in gain. I'm going to say that again. The world will use you for, as, for what they can get from you as long as they can get it from you. But when they're done, they're done. The world only cares what it can gain, not what it can give. The world only gives to what it thinks it can get back in gain. And verse 19, it says, When her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas. We don't know what happens. Uh, I said Barnabas, Silas, said, excuse me. Uh, we don't know what happened to this damsel. All we know is she had served her purpose. She was done. That's how the world looks at you and I and young people and any of us that are living and breathing today. The world wants to get you. They want to have you. The world, the flesh, and the devil are constantly on a 24-7 to come after you. But let me tell you something. When they're done with you, they are done. That's it. Right. I, I remember in my days in working uh, in the, the public arena and in several places in Chick-fil-A and Cintas, I remember seeing those people, how the world was getting every last drop of their paycheck, how the world was getting every last drop of their free time on Saturdays and Sundays, how the world, and the world didn't care. All they were caring about is why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you spending more money on booze? Why aren't you spending more money on alcohol? Why aren't you spending more money on drugs? Why aren't you spending more money on immorality? They didn't care what they were giving to them. They were giving, now the, the, they were seeing as, as the world is giving me relief. The world has given me an out. The world has given me uh, some, some, uh, some mental stress. That's how they saw it. But here's how the world says it. They're keeping giving. They're still holding on. They're still addicted. They're still coming. That's all the world cares about. They don't care about those person's needs. They don't care about those person's relationships. And here we have this soothsayer and she's being used. But you know what? When Paul and Silas cast that demon out of her, when they were done, they were done. And I just say this just kind of as a side note, when the world gets from you what it's going to get from you, it's done. But it's only going to get from you what you're giving it. So let's be careful. Verse number 20. Let's just keep going on. And, bought them to, and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. I guess they were having a bad day. And verse 23, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And here's a very famous scripture verse for all of us. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. How incredible. Verse 27. And the keepers of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Let's have a quick word of prayer. And I want to bring to you a message. It's amazing what praising can do. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us, Lord, to preach. And I pray that you would, Lord, more importantly, Use the Word of God. I pray that you would use me as a vessel, but Lord, only a vessel. I pray that you would use the Word of God to speak and minister to the, to the hearts of the people here and that we would be a blessing. We thank you for this church. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful spirit. And Lord, in all things, we give you praise and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I got a couple of questions. Have you ever been discouraged before? You ever been discouraged? Have you ever been mistreated before? Now, these are some good ones. Have you ever faced a problem that you couldn't walk away from? Have you ever been so hurt and troubled that you felt as though your tears and emotions became in themselves a prison? If you answered yes to any of these, that means one of two things. Number one, you're actually listening to the preaching. Congratulations. <laughs> Number two, you're not alone in your troubles, nor are you without hope or help. In our Bible, we read it of an account of the missionary dynamic duo, Paul and Silas. Here they are, Batman and Robin, Paul and, Bar Paul and Silas who have, through unfortunate and deceitful circumstances, found themselves in prison, beaten, bruised, and I guess a little uncomfortable. Yet in verse 25, we read a truly unbelievable response to their truly unbelievable circumstance. Here are Paul and Silas. I guess they've been mistreated a little bit. They've been deceived a little bit. They've been tricked maybe just a little bit. They've had it rough maybe just a little bit. And here they are coming through trying to do the work of the Lord. And wouldn't you know it? The devil's trying to foil their plans. Well, I've never heard that before. Isn't that something? How, they're, how they've been captured, how they've been, been kind of cornered, how they've been corralled in, and they've been tricked and deceived. Here they've been beaten. They've been thrown into prison. Things are not going their way. It has not been a good day for them. But here we read in verse 25, it says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas did two things that 
we would never have guessed they would have done. If we would have told you that Paul and Silas, they would have been uh, deceived by uh, this, this woman possessed, then they would have been beaten and thrown into prison. What do you think their response would be? I, maybe they'd be a little mad. Um, <laughs> maybe they'd be a little upset. Maybe they would be a little bit confused. Maybe they would be a little bit bitter. And we'd probably say, well, sure. But here we read, it says, they prayed and they sang praises unto God. Here's the thing I'd like to point out. It, in a, it's amazing what praising can do. Number one, praise acknowledges. Praise acknowledges. Praise is to glorify, especially by the attribution of perfection, to express a favorable judgment. They trusted God in prayer and praised God in song. You see, when our path of life reaches a valley or a hill of despair and defeat, it's not time to leave the praises we sang, sang back on the peak. You know, it's time to sing a little bit louder in the valley because sound doesn't travel that far in the valley. It travels real far on the peak. When we're up high, when we're standing up, oh, singing amazing what praising can do, boy, it travels far and it travels wide. It travels through Instagram. and it, I mean, it travels through every facet. Hey, it's singing. We're singing praises. But when it gets down into the valley, it's a little bit quiet down there. It's a little harder to hear those praises sometimes. It's a little harder when we're in those depths of despair in our, in our emotions and in our life and how life rolls us along. It's kind of hard to hear in the valley, but that's not when it's time to give up. It's time to sing in the valley. It's time to, 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 to sing in the hollers, as we would call it back in Kentucky. It's time to, to sing when you've got over the top of the hill and you're coming down the bottom. When you're coming through the briars, it's time to sing His praises a little bit louder. That's not when it's time to give up. When you're in a storm, you don't, you don't paddle less, you paddle more. Uh, when you're in a struggle, when you're in a fight, you don't, you don't, fight, you don't uh, uh, withstand less, you withstand more. Right. You don't want to be defeated. You, that's when it's time to buckle down, as we'd say, and give it all you got. Right. Uh, when, when you're climbing up the hill and you got third gear, you back there and you go grab fourth and you get up there, put it in the bulldog. That's a Kentucky term, in case you didn't know. Bulldogs grabbing a low gear to get up in a high place. There you go. So just, you learned something tonight. There you go. Put it in the bulldog, son. I didn't even have that in my message, but boy, that was good. Uh, <laughs> but it acknowledges. We're in the valley. Praise acknowledges God. Psalm seven seventeen says this, I will praise the Lord according to His righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. You know what? When we put God in our praises, we're taking ourselves out of the picture right. and realizing who's in control. Right. There's somebody just a little bit bigger. There's somebody who knows just a little bit more. Somebody who can see just a little bit farther down the road. Praise acknowledges. Because you know why? We're not talking about ourselves anymore. We're talking about the Lord. It's hard to talk about yourself and sing Amazing Grace. It's hard to talk about yourself while you're praying for others. It's hard to look at your own needs when you're too busy thanking the Lord for what He's done for you. Praise acknowledges God. Second of all, and I hasten, praise testifies. Praise testifies. Very important part of this scripture. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. But what does that next part of the verse says? And the prisoners heard them. Amen. Let me ask you something. Do others hear you talk about and praise your God? Can others hear your praises? Can others hear your testimony? I'm talking about our family, our lost family. I'm talking about our co-workers, our lost co-workers. Yeah. Listen, I, re I remember when those days that when I was working with Centos. I heard all day long the world praising their gods. They had gods of fame. They have gods of fashion. They had gods of drugs. They have gods of drinking. They had gods of immorality. They had gods of wealth. They have gods of prosperity. They had gods all over the place. And they had no problem singing the praises of their gods. Yeah. Why don't we let them hear a chorus of, oh, how I love Jesus? Why don't we let them hear a chorus of, love lifted me? Why don't we let, let them hear a chorus of, Jesus is the sweetest name I know? Or, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Hey, I mean, actually let them hear those songs. What do you mean? I mean, actually sing those songs. Let me tell you something. One of the things that when I was, when I was there and they would be blasting up their, their rock music, every now and again I might sing a chorus of, oh, how I love Jesus, maybe just accidentally a little too loud, you know? Uh, I, I might slip in something in there like a... a I had a co-worker, his name was Jack. I have a lot of stories with Jack. Boy, we had a good time. And at least I did. And uh, Jack, Jack told me one time, he said, he said, John, he said, uh, why, uh, I'm ready to get off work and knock back a cold one. You know what I mean? 
I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. Now, before, he had told me this great story. Oh, it's this hilarious story. He got everybody rolling how he had been partying all night one night and how he, uh, he got so intoxicated that he forgot where his car was. Couldn't find it. Two days later, his buddy called him and said, hey, I found your car by the side of the road. And he said, well, where is it? It was two hours from where he was at. He had no idea how he got there. So he had told me that story earlier. Wrong idea. And uh, he asked me, he said, you, you, I'm ready to knock back a cold one. You know what I mean, man? I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, don't you drink uh, uh, beer? Uh, never touch the stuff. Uh, don't you drink uh, a bourbon? Uh, never touch the stuff. And he just went and list on. He, I mean, he had more alcohol beverages than there are in the pot machine. I mean, he just went down and list them all. And he said, well, John, why don't you drink? I said, Jack, crazy thing. Sometimes you might drink, and then you wake up the next day, and your car is two hours away from where you are. I, I don't, I, that's just one of my reasons. I know it's wild, but that's one of my reasons. <laughs> he didn't have much to say. But I remember some of those times it was necessary. You know what? I made a decision when I was there working with those men. I said, if you're going to be so blatant and you're going to be so bold to talk about what you're doing after work, I'm not going to have a problem telling you what I did on Sunday. Amen. If you're going to be so bold and so blazing to take my God's name in vain, I'm not going to have a narrow bit of problem praising his name a little bit when I have an opportunity to. If you're going to be so blatant to tell me how so good you have it in your terrible... I mean, they, they come to work and they talk about all their troubles. They talk about all oh, uh, the problems at home, problems with this. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing just fine. God's been good to me. I remember I got a car. They said, John, that's a new car. I said, man, the Lord give that to me. And it was like a calf at a new gate. They had, what are you talking about, man? That's not Santa Claus. I never heard of that guy before. I said, you wouldn't believe it. And I told them the story. Did they like it? I didn't care. Because I was, too, I kept hearing their stories about how they, how they uh, spent money on this and spent money. Listen, the world needs to hear us testify a little bit. The world needs to hear us listen. Because you know what? They're actually looking for that. I'll tell you something this. I was amazed. I was amazed at this. If you're willing to be a little bit bold with them, that's okay. Because sometimes they're going to push the limit on you. Sometimes they would come around and he said, Jack told me one time, he said, John, I'm going to get you to cuss one day. And I looked back and said, Jack, and I'm going to get you to say hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> we went back and forth. And, but I'm telling you, I made a decision. If, you're, if the world is going to be so bold to wear their prized possessions, if they're going to be so bold to wear what they have on the outside, I'm not going to have a narrow bit of problem to do it myself. Amen. Hey, the world needs to hear us testify. The world needs to hear that chorus of, oh, how I love Jesus. And I mean that actual song. Be humming a tune. Be singing a song. It should be in our heart anyway. Hey, if, when, the, when the world comes and asks you, hey, how was your weekend? It was great. I was at church. The buses were running. We had people say, man, you should have heard the pastor's pals. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They're going to say, say, I'm not done. Stay right there, buddy. Keep, keep them going. Pin them up against the wall. They open that door. You're going to walk through it. And, uh, but I'm saying the world needs to hear us testify. And the prisoners... Heard them. Right. Number, number three, and I hasten, praise activates. Praise activates. Not only does praise acknowledge, not only does praise testify, but let's look at verse 26. And suddenly, suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. Praise during the dark and down days of your life become a spiritual beacon to God. Letting Him know there's one child, one of His children, in trouble, but trusting. It says, Lord, this is terrible. But just thinking of you and expressing how much I love you makes everything okay. It says, God, I'm not really sure why, but okay. You ever been there? Where you're just like, God? <laughs> but okay. It's going to be okay. I remember being some of those times in my life where I'm just like, why are, why are we moving? Why, why am I going through this? Why has this happened to me? But okay. I know it's going to be all right. Because all things work together for good. To them who, right. Right. it's going to be okay. Yeah. Just hold on. Joy comes in the morning. His mercies are new. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Now's not the time to give up. Right. It's saying, God, I don't understand, and I don't have to. That's, right. That's okay. That's right. I trust you. 
Because here's the, here's the amazing part about this. Notice how the help came not before their prayers and songs of praise, but after. And they didn't do it to cause an earthquake. Because it, ha- it wasn't like they were singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love... It wasn't like the earthquake was suddenly happening. It wasn't like it was just coming on as the, as the more courses they sang, the more the foundation started to move. No, no, no. They were singing the songs of praise. They were pray- praying to God. And it says, suddenly, suddenly it happened all out of nowhere. Boom, shakalaka. It happened. <laughs> but it wasn't... Be- it wasn't- they, didn't- they didn't praise for the earthquake. They praised... And the earthquake. You know, some of us need an answer from God. If I was to say, who here needs an answer from God? I'm sure all of our hands would probably be up on both hands. But you know, we're spending our time pouting instead of praising. You know, God didn't give an answer to somebody who was in the corner of the jail, sitting there all quiet. That's not who he was. That's not who he answered. That's not what activated God. What activated God is their songs of praise. What activated God was their prayers of supplication to Him, trusting Him. That's what activated God. You need an answer from God today? Why not, not, why, why not instead of looking for an answer, you trust God for the answer and just praise Him anyway? Because, you know, God makes a way where there isn't a way. I heard Pastor Fugate say that many a times. You know, you go all throughout the Bible. When Moses came to the Red Sea, God didn't tell him what was going to happen. He had to trust Him just a little bit. When they needed water, He had to trust God just a little bit. And we can go down through the ages where God didn't, there wasn't a way that was clear, but God provided a way. And here's the thing, you know, we need to trust God just a little bit for him to be in our lives. Because, you know, God was afraid to bless the children of Israel just too much. Because if they did, they'd get their eyes off of him and they'd get it on the bounty. I want the blessings, not the bounty. The bounty runs out. The blessings are everlasting. God can bless you, but you have to be somebody who he can bless. You have to be a willing vessel. It's just like pastor with us today. He's got he's to have something to work with. And if you quit pouting and maybe praising a little bit, if I quit pouting and praising a little bit, we might find God activated in our lives. Yeah. Praising yeah. activates. Yeah. And last but not least, praise opens. Praise opens. Mm. The Bible says suddenly, verse 26, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were what does the Bible say? Opened. And everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. You know what praise opens? Praise not only acknowledges God, not only does praise testify, not only does praise activate, But lastly, praise opens. It opens doors. Doors to freedom. Freedom from hurt. Freedom from loss. Freedom from darkness. Notice how the captor became captivated by what he had felt and seen. Verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The Bible says in verse 29, it says, Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. He was at their mercy. The captor became captivated. He became captivated by their faith. He became captivated by their praise. And let me tell you something. Not only does praise activate God in our lives, but you'll find that praise a lot of times will activate God in other people's lives. I'm telling you what, it's hard to be, to be a stinker when you're around somebody who's too busy praising God. They ain't got time to worry about the problems. They ain't got time to worry about uh, the naysayers. They're too busy praising. You ever been around those people that they're just a joy to be around? I'm telling you, it's hard. I can remember a lot of people in my life. That you, if you're ever around my grandfather, father, my grandmother, my dad talked about today, you're going to have a hard time uh, being down on your luck. They got so much to praise for. And if you ask them their list of problems, they could go on and on and on, but they don't. They're too busy praising God. They're too busy looking at the blessing. They're too busy looking at what they have, not what they don't have. You know, that's what the problem with the children of Israel in the wilderness, they were looking at the manna and saying, it's not enough. And God's saying, you didn't have anything at all. Before I came along, you got nothing. You know, it's like, uh, it's like growing up. We were thankful for what we had, because that's what we had. (laughs) Well, I wish I had that. Well, you don't have it, son. (laughs) Congratulations. You win a star. We're too busy thinking, God, what we do have. 
Why would God give you more if you're not satisfied with what you have now? Why would God bless you if you're not thankful? I'm thankful that I grew up in a house, and I can say this, where the attitude was gratitude. And I mean for everything. We said thank you for everything. We got a whooping and said thank you. <laughs> not quite, not quite. There may be a little preaching there. Maybe a little bit of preaching there. But, but mom and dad, we, we always, were, thank, we always were, were taught to be thankful. And I'm sure glad of that. Because you know what? It's not just the big things in life that we ought to be thankful for. I teach this to the kids in junior church all the time. It's not the big things. Of course, we're thankful for God. We're thankful for the Bible. We're thankful that we're citizens of the United States of America. I, I, but, I mean, let's talk about the little things. Can we be thankful that we all got to church here safely tonight? Can we be thankful that, praise God, uh, we, uh, well, most of us are in our sound mind. Uh, we thank God that we, have, that we do have heat. We do have, like, there, there are so many little things to be thankful for. But if we're not willing to be thankful in the little things, why are we going to be thankful for the big things? Paul and Silas here, their praise to God, their, their acknowledgement of God, it opened doors for them, opened doors of freedom, freedom from bondage. Is there something in your life that it just has you captive? I mean, it, there's, there's a trial, there's a, there's a memory, uh, there's a person, uh, there, there is a place that is a prison to you. I, I, I love the illustration I heard in college that, that bitterness only affects the container that it's in. If I have two containers here, and this one is full, and this one is empty, and this one's full of bitterness, it's not affecting this container. It's only affecting the container it's in. You think the, pe the, pe the person you're bitter at, the memory you're bitter at, the place you're bitter at, do you think they're losing sleep? No. They don't care. That's probably why you're bitter at them. Am I right? That, that memory, you're gone. You weren't even a blink in their eye. That place, it's past. You don't live there anymore. Bitterness only affects the container it's in. It's like drinking poison and thinking it's going to kill the other person. <laughs> that, that, that praise, thanking God for where you are at now. Hey, praise God, you're, you're in the best church in the world, Frederick Baptist Church. Thank God there's a, there's, a, there's a family support here. I don't know what the past holds for you, but the future is awful bright. And you need to let go of that and start praising God for what He's done for you. Because whatever, whatever you have gone through, it's brought you here. Yeah, and you think about this. Thank God that Paul and Silas were in that jail. You know why? Because they had a prison ministry soon after. Amen. Bunches of people got saved. The jailer got saved. They started a prison ministry. Amen. So wherever God has you now, thank God He has you here because of where you're at Amen. and who you can minister now. Amen. It opens doors of freedom from hurt, from loss, from darkness. And it opens doors to witness. Notice that not only did this revival service have an effect on the jailer, but the prisoners that were with them. Verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are, what does the Bible say? All here. You never know who's watching and listening. You may be the only Bible someone reads. You hear that all the time. And I hate to say this, this is sad. You may be the only Christian someone ever knows. I'm sad to say that I was the only outspoken Christian that I knew of in my entire plant. I mean, I got, que got asked questions all the time. People were always so curious on, you know, John, you don't do this, you don't do that. No, no. I don't smoke, chew, or run with those that do, you know, as my papa would say. You, but you may be the only Christian somebody ever knows. I, that's sad to say. We would think in America that's not the case. So what kind of example, if you were in the jail, if you were Paul, if you were Silas, how would the rest of the verses read after verse 25? Is there going to be a jailer and some, some to boot that are going to hear your testimony? It says they were all there. The Bible says, Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul's and Silas' feet. It gives us a door to witness. It is amazing what praising can do. But you know what? We have to make that decision. Paul and Silas didn't look at the circumstance. They kept their eyes up. They were shackled. They were beaten. They were mistreated. They were deceived. For some of us, it may sound like a personal testimony. 
But Paul and Silas, verse 25, took a turn and said they prayed and they sang praises. And then look what God did afterwards. They didn't know verse 26 was there. They didn't know about verse 26. They didn't know about verse 27 through 30. That's right. They didn't know about that. That's true. All they knew was verses, six, uh, verses 1 through 24. Right. Hey, God has another verse in your life. That's good. Amen. But is your praise going to get it there? Amen. And is your prayers going to make it? That's good. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Lord, I pray that this sermon was a help. And Lord, I pray that we would be reminded of the testimony of Paul and Silas on what our praise can do, not just for us, but for others in our situation. And Lord, I pray that when we come to those valleys, that we'll still be singing the songs that we sang on the peak. And Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name.